Hello, Grade 12s. Shortly, we'll be joining Deasha as she teaches her students, Michelle and Dabucho, about trigonometric identities and equations. For homework, they needed to look at a long list of equations and determine if they were true for all values of theta. Let's join them now as they go through their findings. Let me start by explaining the difference between an identity and other equations. In mathematics, we use the term identity when statements of equality are true for all values of the variable or variables. Other equations are true for only a limited number of values of the variable. Here are a mixture of identities and equations for you to sort into two groups. Those which are true for all values of the variable and are therefore identities and those which are true for only some values of the variable or variables. If you're not sure about some of the examples, just substitute a few numerical values for the variables and test them. Well, we've examined all eight examples and I'm confident about most of them. But I'm having trouble with a few of those. That's fine, Michelle. We'll take each one in turn. Now, what did you say about sine 180 minus theta equals sine theta? I started as you suggested by substituting a few values for theta and I couldn't find one that didn't work. Then I remember that last year our teacher called these equations reduction formulas and we proved that they were all true for all the values of theta. Well done. All the reduction formulas are identities. Here are some more reduction formulas. Cos of 90 minus alpha equals sine of alpha. Tan of minus beta equals negative tan of beta. And there are several more like them. Let's look at the next one on the list I gave you. Is cos of 60 degrees minus x always equal to sine x? No, it's not. I used 45 degrees for x, so because cos 15 degrees is certainly not equal to sine 45 degrees, it is not an identity. Well, the good thing about the ones that aren't identities is that a single counter example proves it. Well done. This is an equation and is true for some values of x. Were you able to solve it to work out which values of x it is true for? Well, to be honest, I didn't try, but I think I can. I could use the fact that sine x is equal to cosine 90 degrees minus x for all x. With this change, I get that the cosine of one angle equals cosine of another angle. This is only possible if one angle is equal to plus or minus the other angle. And don't forget that the angle could have k times 360 degrees added to it. k is an integer. Excellent, Avoho. I'm particularly impressed that in giving the general solution, you included the condition that k must be an integer. If any of you are not sure about the trick that Taboho has used here, check what he has done with your classroom textbook. Right, we won't bother to tidy that up or get final answers at this stage. Now let's move on to the next question. Sine squared alpha plus cos squared alpha equals 1. That one was easy. I recognized it from the basic identity that we used quite a lot last year. You're right, and it is easy to prove that this equation is true for any value of alpha. How about the next one? Sine beta plus cos beta equals zero. Well, that's definitely an equation. I actually solved this one by subtracting cos beta from both sides and then dividing both sides by cos beta. This gave me tan beta equals minus one. I know that tan beta is 1 at 45 degrees, so it's negative 1 at negative 45 degrees. So the general solution will be minus 45 degrees plus k times 180 degrees for k, any integer. Great, Tabojo. You're really cruising today. Well, thank you. I got through the next two questions easily, but I hit problems later. For the equation cos x degrees equals negative 1, I found a counterexample easily. Cos 60 degrees is not negative 1. For the next one, I didn't think solving cosine alpha minus beta 
equals cosine alpha minus cosine beta is an option. Well, I reckon you need to test for some values on both sides of the equation. First, I worked out cosine alpha minus beta using 60 degrees and 30 degrees. That comes to square root of 3 divided by 2. Then, I worked out cos 60 minus cos 30. This time, I got a half minus the square root of 3 divided by 2. Again, more good work to Boho. You have shown with the counter example that the statement isn't true for all values of alpha and beta. Was it the next one that gave you trouble? We both had problems with the last two. We tried several values of alpha and beta in number 7 and to our surprise they all made the left hand side equal the right hand side. How is that a problem? Perhaps it's an identity. The cosine of the difference between any two angles is equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second plus the sine of the first times the sine of the second. I guess so, but it's such a weird one. Who on earth discovered such a complicated identity? Well, I don't know who discovered it, but it can be a really useful identity. And we can prove it to be true. But first tell me, what was the problem you had with tan theta equals sine theta divided by cosine theta? It seems to be true for most values of theta, but we found some exceptions, so we didn't know what to call it. When we made theta equal to 90 degrees, we found that the denominator of cos 90 is 0. Actually, we remembered that tan 90 isn't on the tan graph either. There's an asymptote at 90 degrees. Well spotted. We can't say that this identity is true for all values of the variable. What we can do is state the exceptions. The identity tan theta equals sine theta divided by cosine theta is true for all theta except theta equal to 90 degrees and any multiple of 180 degrees. So we write it like this. All these values of theta give a zero denominator on the right hand side. Look at the graph of tan theta again. There are asymptotes at those values of theta, tan 90, tan minus 90, tan 270 degrees, and so on, do not exist. Now, let's go back to the proof I said I would show you. I'm going to prove to you that cosine alpha minus beta is always equal to cosine alpha times cosine beta plus sine alpha times sine beta. There are other proofs in some texts, but this one works for all values of alpha and beta. Positive, negative, reflex, you name it. Sounds complicated. Not if you take it one step at a time. In this sketch, angle AOC is called alpha, and I have marked it in red. Angle BOC is beta, marked in blue. Can you use alpha and beta to define angle AOB now? Angle AOB will be alpha minus beta. Let's mark this angle in green. Because I've used a unit circle, a circle with a radius of 1, the point C has coordinates 1, 0. Alright, let's start with point A. A is on the arms of the angle AOB, which we've called alpha minus beta. Can we write the coordinates of a in terms of the trig ratios of alpha. Okay, I think I've got it. I'll give it a try. Um, the cosine of alpha is x over r. But then what? It helps to remember that we are working in a unit circle, so r is 1. Oh, I see it. So the x coordinate of A is just cos alpha. The y coordinate will have something to do with sine alpha. Sine alpha is y over r. And since again r is 1, the y coordinate of the point A is sine alpha. I can write the coordinates of A as cos alpha sine alpha. That wasn't too difficult. Good. Now what about the coordinates of B? The x value will be cos beta. 
and the y value is sine beta. I'll write them in. And now comes a really important step. We already saw that angle AOB is alpha minus beta. It's the red angle alpha minus the blue angle beta. Watch this carefully. I'm going to move a copy of angle AOB into standard position to help us with the proof. So I'm going to move it until OB lies on the positive x-axis. If I do that, can you see that OA will move too, but it will still be in the second quadrant. OK, now I'm going to call the point where this ray cuts the unit circle D. Can you find the coordinates of D in the same way as before? So, the angle DOC is still the same size as the original angle AOB, right? Right. It is still alpha minus beta. Then D must be the point cos alpha minus beta sine alpha minus beta. I'll write it in. I'm beginning to see how this can help us with our proof. Can you see that triangles AOB and DOC are congruent? This will be true no matter what sizes alpha and beta are. They look congruent, but I guess that's not good enough. Um, oh yes, I see it now. Both have two sides, each one unit long, and the included angles will always be equal. That's correct. The triangles will always be congruent, so the chords AB and DC will always be equal in length. The only time this doesn't work is if the angles created are reflex instead of obtuse, but we won't look at that exception for now. Now, can you use the distance formula to work out expressions for AB squared and DC squared in terms of their coordinates? While they're busy, perhaps you might like to also try to apply the distance formula. Here I wrote the distance formula for AB using X and Y. Then I substituted the trig ratios. At this step, I multiplied out the brackets. With DC, I used the trig ratios we found at D and the 1, 0 at C. Then I multiplied out the brackets and simplified. Well, that was a complicated pair of expressions. But we can tidy them up a bit. There are some ones in disguise in both expressions. Remember that cos squared alpha plus sine squared alpha is 1. So this term and this term make 1. So the expression for AB squared becomes minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta minus 2 sine alpha sine beta. And adding the two ones, we get a plus 2 at the end. Then by taking out a common factor, minus 2, we get minus 2 times cosine alpha, cosine beta plus sine alpha, sine beta, minus 1. And I see in the expression for dc squared, there's another one in disguise. Cosine squared alpha minus beta plus sine squared alpha minus beta. So that becomes minus 2 cosine alpha minus beta plus 2. And there's a common factor of minus 2 here as well. Right, nearly there. These two expressions are equal to each other. We can divide both sides by minus 2 and then adding 1 to both sides, we get that weird identity that worried you so much. We call this a compound angle formula because alpha minus beta is a compound angle. Wasn't that bad, but there was quite a lot of manipulation to be done. There are similar identities for cosine alpha plus beta and also for sine alpha plus beta and sine alpha minus beta. But you'll be pleased to hear that it's fairly simple to deduce these identities from the one we have just proved. Now, I'm going to give you a few clues and then ask you to derive these three identities for your task for today. We'd better write these clues down. Don't worry, I'll give you the first line and then you can just continue from there. 
for cosine alpha plus beta, we just write the alpha plus beta as alpha minus minus beta. And then we use the identity for cosine alpha minus beta, where alpha is just alpha and beta is replaced by minus beta. And then you can continue. We'll need to remember that some ratios of the negative angles are equal to the ratio of the positive angles. And some ratios of negative angles are opposite in sign to the ratio of the positive angles. Good thinking. And for the sine of alpha plus beta, we use another identity. We write sine alpha plus beta as cosine 90 degrees minus alpha plus beta. And then we rearrange the terms in the square bracket to 90 minus alpha, the first angle, minus beta, the second angle. Then we use the first identity again. The cosine of one angle minus another is the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle plus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And this time the first angle is 90 minus alpha and the second one is just beta. Great, I've given you ways to manipulate cosine alpha minus beta and sine alpha plus beta. You can find your own way to manipulate sine alpha minus beta. Thank you for joining us. Practice what you have learned by doing the questions in the advanced trigonometry task video. You'll also be able to learn more about trigonometry on our website www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye.